consumerism. A new middle class with money to burn wanted fancy goods to show they'd arrived. High tea was trendy. White tablecloths, the latest cutlery from Sheffield, and tea served in fine bone china. But fine bone china and best Darjeeling don't appear on the tea table by magic. And up here in the potteries, there are an awful lot of anonymous workers who bore the brunt of all this social aspiration. For instance, to make fine bone china, you need bone. And the person cleaning all the bone was the bone cleaner, <laughs> Angela. I was supposed to immediately start asking you about bone cleaning, but as I came around the corner, there was this massive whiff. These things are literally crawling with maggots. Why have they got maggots all over them? Well, it's old bone. They didn't uh, kill animals just for the pottery industry. It was bone from anywhere, usually cattle bone. So it's been lying about for a while, and the uh, unpleasant job for you is to clean it. Oh, it really stinks, doesn't it? You have to add some water to that as well. You have to get every as much as you can off that. Once they've cleaned all the rotting meat off the bones, what do they do with them? Well, they do. The next thing that happens is that they're more thoroughly cleaned in, in water and yeah. then they're burnt, they're calcined, which takes out all the glue and the, the jelly from the inside of the bone, makes it really soft and you can grind it down, mix it with the clay to make bone china. Ah, it really is quite hard, isn't it? I thought it'd be quite easy to cut the meat off, particularly with these knives, but it, it's not enough cling. Do we know anything about the people who did this job? It was a job which women did. Um, surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise, yeah. And we know that they hated the stink as well. They also talk about how sore their hands were being in the, the cold and the wet all the time. Oh, it's not just me being squeamish. No, sorry. Oh, it's just a bit, though. <laughs> <laughs> How much bone is there in bone china? It's about half, half clay and half bone. Why use bone? It gives it whiteness. You can make a very thin body and it's translucent. It's all the qualities you associate with bone china come from the bone. So all these middle class people would have been drinking their tea with their little fingers curled, totally unaware that what they would be drinking out of was 50% uh, made out of that. Been a bit of an eye opener, <laughs> wouldn't it? Yep, it would. You can smell rotting meat a mile off, but a greater danger was that there were no health and safety inspectors around to warn you about some of the more invisible dangers like arsenic and lead, which did for so many workers during the Industrial Revolution. And here in the potteries, there was this stuff, the dust that floated through the air all the time, particularly during the final stages of the process when the workers were finishing off the pots. This stuff could give you potter's rot or pneumoconiosis, which was a lung disease which was potentially fatal. But hazards lurked among even the most innocent looking jobs. Even the pressers who made the cup handles risked injury to their internal organs. So you've got to press it together and push hard. Go apart. They called it jumping because they actually landed, oh, yeah, you can landed see that, yeah. on their stomachs with it if it went smaller. Yeah. I see what you mean by jumping because after a while you just actually, you want to get your feet off the ground in order to put your weight on. And I suppose the smaller you are, the lighter you are, so the more you've got to do that. There's testimony that was taken in the 1840s. A young lad called Herbert Bell. He talks about how it hurts his stomach, how hot it is, about 98 degrees in the factory. You're also right over the clay, breathing that dust in all the time. How many of these would they have had to make in a day? They've been making about 50 dozen a day, uh, working with a team of others. Hang on, 50 dozen, that's 720. No, five, five, what's five to six? 600. 600 a day. 600 a day. Here we are, let's see if I've actually managed to cut through. Oh, not bad. Then you take the excess off. Should really let it dry a little bit first, but then. Mm. Oh, that's it has it. cut, oh, isn't that's it? good. Do you know, I think that's the first time in this series that I've actually managed to complete a job with some degree of efficiency. Except the middle of it isn't cut out. Industry reduced workers to tiny cogs in a giant production machine. Workers did one small repetitive job day in, day out. There were fettlers, piecers, placers, and sagger makers bottom knockers. 
The drawer's only job was to take the fired pottery out of the kiln, quick. Imagine balancing on a ladder inside an oven that's been heated to 1400 degrees and shifting 10 kilos of burning hot pots onto your head. Oh, God, it feels like it's going to go. Oh. One breakage and every single person in the chain would have their wages docked. So that's the china sorted. But our high tea set also needs cutlery. And for that, you need another terrible job, a hundred miles up the road in Sheffield. The buffalass worked by hand, polishing knives, forks and spoons. Thousands of them, all day, every day. Emma? Hi. I want to be a buffalass. What do I have to do? Right, come on, let's uh, dress you up first, oh, I yes, think, please. then. Right, well, uh, buffalasses, they wore... Uh, what they call a buff brat, which is a bit like an operational kind of gown with strings behind your back so you didn't get them caught in the machine. This is one of these? Something similar to this. What's it called again? A buff brat. A buff brat. So we tie that round your back so yeah. that you don't get caught. Um, you want a brown paper. Now you might think, why brown paper? Yeah. Very readily available. Um, they would use this in the in the work in the workplace to wrap all the finished products together so and I put this on you put this on as an apron round your middle this absorbed the oil that was used in the buffing process they used trent sand and oil and this would be absorbed rather than getting your nice calico outfit was it uh, really dirty. that mucky a job oh it was definitely yeah the dirt bit comes when you do the buffing and the, um, the sand and the oil flick off from the wheel as you're as you're passing the knives, forks and spoons through the through and underneath the wheel. Yeah. Put these round your legs to protect your legs because you don't want to get oil on them either. Um, they often got mucky faces and um, impregnated dirt in their hands as what, well. Dirt that would actually sort of never not, come not off. come out. No. What kind of girls were these? They were notoriously loud, seemingly, and rowdy. They were often known to be foul-mouthed, and the language that came out of some of these workshops was uh, not to be repeated here. And uh, in their workplaces as well, men didn't dare go through the doors. I bet they were terrified. I bet they were terrified. They'd probably get shouted at and rubbed down with sand and oil. Um, this is the buffing wheel, and now you're in your costume. Yeah. Shall we give it a go? Yeah, yeah. Um, in the pot here that you can see we've got Trent sand and oil so these were dipped and rubbed before they were ground can you smell it Ooh, it's like smelling a petrol pump <laughs> so should we give it a go we start with something easy a knife and okay. are you ready yeah I'm ready. hold it fairly well underneath because yeah. it's going to come towards you and the dirt will possibly flick up at you you all right there oh yeah all well, the dirt keeps bouncing off the wheel onto my face that would have been very to... good for you no, I mean, it would get impregnated in your fingers, all the oil and the sand. But also, you'd get dermatitis. Many of them suffered from that. As a, an errand last to start with, you'd do odd jobs around the factory. Yeah. You'd work your way up then to doing handles, and then eventually you'd get some more complex things like spoons and forks, because they're a lot more intricate. It's the same my hands. <laughs> Oh, gosh. It's pretty mucky, isn't it? Yeah, the oil's becoming impregnated now, which yeah. is, the buffer girls have that, and they were quite disfigured, really. How many of these girls do you reckon there would have been in a factory? Um, several hundred, but say in, like, one workshop, there'd be long benches down each side, and there'd be 25 to 50 people, all with their own individual wheels. It'd be very loud and rowdy. Imagine this, 50 times over. Buffer lasses were paid by the piece, which kept them glued to their machines. But every piece had to be perfect. There you are. That's not bad, is it? Well, perhaps compare them to these ones. That's just the beginning of the process. So the various stages of buffing, and this is your end product before they'd be packaged and sent away.